Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 850. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's eight is today. April 9th, 2024. <laughs> All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. Uh, this is our happy place. This is where Kevin and George sit down and we get to hash ourselves over the news, over events that are going on around the world. And we, we also have our own funny stories that we tell each other off camera and off uh, on camera. So um, we're glad you're here. We're glad you like it. And we hope we can give you some information about what, what's happening around the Anglican communion this week. George, how you doing? Great, fantastic. Uh, well, I lie. I went to the <laughs> cardiologist, the urologist, and the uh, pulmonologist today. So I've had two showers today, and uh, I won't <laughs> explain why. But whenever a man goes to urologist, he usually wants to take a shower when he gets home. Yeah, it's 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 an icky thing, but it keeps us healthy and and living longer. I mean, if you go from you know the Middle Ages when the average lifespan was thirty five to forty years, we're now up to eighty and eighty five years. In another generation, they'll be pushing a hundred years. They they have to look around and poke around and make sure everything's running, George. And uh, you got a new pacemaker, and you're all checked out, so you can do another at least another hundred fifty episodes. That'll take us up to a thousand. Oh, that's crazy, George. That, you know, all these years, almost 10 years now, we've been doing the show. That's just crazy. Yeah, we're still not making money. <laughs> no, there's no money out there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Early in the episode here, we're still raising uh, funds for George to go to, um, uh, you're going to Cairo? Egypt. Uh, Egypt, yep. Alexandria, Egypt, uh, to, to attend the Global South uh, function. We've raised about $1,000. Uh, we need about 1500 more. Uh, so uh, if you want to go to Anglican, Anglican, you can spell it. It's not Angelican. It's Anglican.inc forward slash donate. And you can help send George uh, on to another continent. All right. So um, if nobody was paying attention, yesterday here in North America, right down the middle, we had an eclipse. I got to see it in its totality. And I, wow. Okay. <laughs> I've been around the world. I've seen many things. And uh, I think that the eclipse is, you know, is one of the top things I've ever seen. A total eclipse. You know, my brother was in Wisconsin. He sent me pictures. Yeah, not a big deal. No, it, it, you need to be right here in, in Arkansas. And it, we just saw it was amazing because uh, you can look in your glasses as it's building up. You could see it going across. And at about 98 percent. Uh, coverage it's still not a it, the, the the area around you the atmosphere around you has dimmed a lot it's dimmed like 50 percent in that uh, hour it took for this the moon to go over the sun but <clears> that <throat> last one percent when you fully get the coverage it dims it, it'll go another 50 percent and so you're looking at like 25 percent uh light that you had 15 minutes ago and all the animals stopped all the sound stopped and I'm sitting with a group of people just going, wow, wow, wow. So if you ever ch get a chance in your continent to, to see an eclipse, I recommend it. It's four minutes of wow, wow, wow. So that's, you know, so that's what I did. Uh, if you want to know, we are uh, traveling again this summer. We're going from uh, uh, Florida, way over here somewhere out west to Utah, Idaho, that's just a quick glance at the map of my trip until September. But we got news, George. Let's go on to the news stories here. Our first news story is the Dignitas Infinitas. Infita. How do you pronounce I'm not a Latin guy, George. Can you pronounce that for me. Dignitas Infinita. Yeah, it's a paper on gender ideology. And um, I, I think the liberals are happy. Well, let's talk about this. It's a Francis paper. There's yeah. good and there's bad. Now, a we we announced we we shared with you on Friday. It was coming out on Monday, yeah. and we had, and remember the things I was talking about were not this paper, uh, but rather the work that is being done uh, in preparation for the next series of papers. 
uh, the Teilhard de Chardin stuff and the Cosmic Christ. This paper has been under work for about five years, they said, and it came out and a surface quick reading has some good stuff in it. Uh, they're against sex change, uh, surgery, uh, transgenderism, they're against in vitro fertilization or surrogacy, you know, where where a gay couple hires a woman to bear, uh, bear a child for them. Mm -hmm. And it's against gender ideology. Well, George, those are all great things. Why are you still not just saying, oh, this is the best thing since sliced bread? Because there's as great as much and if not more bad things in this. And it takes time to basically dig all through things. But I, I, I want to make two points because I don't, I'm not prepared to give a full critique. But that first, very first paragraph gives the game away because it talks about that first paragraph that human beings have an infinite dignity, it says. Ooh, and whoa, stop. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> and Kevin, you know that's not true. I know that's not true. What? Any Christian who has gone to Sunday school knows that's not true. And why is it not true? Well, uh, um, God is the only infinite uh, dignity uh, uh, being there ever is, will be. Uh, we can never hope for that. We were not designed for that. Yeah, this is uh, this is almost a species of Mormonism that we one day shall be gods too. Yes, that we have such infinite dignity because only God has infinite dignity. Mm -hmm. And when we rebel against God, we lose what dignity we have. Our dignity is only reflection of what God gives us. And when we violate God's laws, when we, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. But this is what I would call a Peronist document. You know, Francis is from Argentina. He's always uh, he's always emulated uh, Juan Perón, the dictator from the 40s. And Perón would do something on the right, then he would do something on the left, and he would play both sides on them against the middle. He's, he's a Justin Welby character, saying to people what they want to hear. And so we've got a few things that satisfy the conservatives who don't want to read past the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the main headings. And then we have the liberals. Uh, when Father James Martin, the Jesuit uh, from America Magazine, who is one of leading public advocates for changing the church's teaching on homosexuality, comes out saying, this is a wonderful document, I want to ask myself, what am I not seeing that he's seeing? Well, when you get deeper and deeper and deeper into this, that there's just a sense of uh, perversion of the human anthropology. But yeah. this is all for another story, when, another day when we've had a chance to actually sink our well, teeth into this. So yeah, I mean, good. but it's, it is, it's another slippery slope that we're going to, uh, this type of document takes us down. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and in, in a big way, it does reteach in a different way the doctrine. Yeah, you know, because we're changing the definition of what it means to be a human, what it means to be transgender, what it means to um, uh, do these things. And uh, in a such, you're changing the doctrine if you're changing the definitions. Let's move on to our next story. Um, now, we didn't report this, and uh, just forgive us for uh, not telling you this, but we had heard through a source that a Ugandan bishop was denied entry into this country, was denied a visa uh, a couple weeks ago. That's when we heard the story. I don't know the exact date he was denied a visa. And from all intents and purposes, we understand that it was because of Uganda's uh, um, laws against homosexuality. And the State Department is a very powerful ent entity in America and outside of America. And they're they're taking their reign further george yeah we heard from an acna bishop that a ugandan was denied a ugandan bishop was denied a visa to enter the united states and the reason was because of the church of uganda and the nation of uganda's support for the anti-lgbt legislation mm -hmm. which by the way the ugandan supreme court upheld uh, last week in a, in a final hearing on it and this ties into what we just talked about of Dignitas Infinita, that uh, if all people have this infinite dignity, the outlawing or criminalization of certain acts, which the Catholic Church on one hand teaches, cry out to heaven for punishment, 
or which are intrinsically disordered, those people still have the infant dignity to practice those acts. Yes. And therefore, the, uh, the State Department is basically now following a Francis line that if you're not going to uh, respect the infinite dignity of everybody that we respect in the ways that we, we define dignity, then you are a bad person. That's crazy. So uh, let's talk about the new law. The uh, the U.S. law or the Ugandan law? Uh, the U.S. law, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, coincidentally with all this, the same State Department who refused to give a visa to one of uh, the Ugandan bishops has now proposed changing some rules, regulations. This is how the bureaucratic state operates. They don't actually bother with Congress anymore. They just take the old rules and then they update them based upon the whims of the people in power. Well, the State Department has announced new guidelines for any entity that in any way receives federal funding for overseas assistance. Now, who would that be? Samaritan's Purse, Fiscal sure. Migration Ministries, a Catholic Charities, the Salvation Army. If you've got a dime in your $10 million budget that can be traced to the U.S. government, you must now not discriminate in employment practices against those who do not share your faith perspective. Now, what does this mean in practice? This means that Catholic Charities, uh, Samaritan's Purse, Billy Graham, Evangelistic Organization, they must now hire, hire people who are transgender, who are gays well, and lesbians. This would even mean the Episcopal Church. Well, they must be going crazy. Well, I, Kevin, I have to tell you, the Episcopal Church has not joined the lawsuit <laughs> filed by the Southern Baptists and Samaritan Purse and other people trying to prevent this rule from coming into play. In other words, the government is basically the U.S. government is basically telling us that you must now conform your uh, faith to these secular religious systems and belief doesn't matter that you may be using this money for feeding the poor doing things the u.s government says is a good thing because you wouldn't get it anyway if it wasn't a good thing but rather we will not even allow you to serve others unless you fully embrace our worldview and our ideology yeah it's crazy i mean here in america it, it's crazy to watch this happen because there's no, it's not a law it's a, mm -hmm. it's a state department it's what, like watching uh the irs slowly take all your money uh the state department you know slowly drain, draining the, the last of our morals uh in texas i think it was D dallas or waco texas um they arrested people for feeding the homeless because the food was not prepared in a, a proper kitchen you know it just I, things like that just drive me crazy. All right, well, so that, that's what we, your State we, Department we see is doing. This, well, we see this with our own U.S. Department of Education. Yep. They are changing their rules of the Title IX about uh, making women's sports equal to men. Yep. They're changing the rules to now have gender expression so that uh, trans. if you do not allow transgender people to participate in women's sports... Mm -hmm. It's not many women are participating in men's sports, but if you do not allow men to participate in women's sports, you may not get any federal money of any sort whatsoever. It's the same sort, and this has not been passed by Congress. This is just a the it, Biden administration, whether it's the State Department or the Department of Education or what have you. Uh, it's the same with the army, you know, with gender ideology and DEI and all this, all this nonsense. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's move on to our next story. Uh, next story. Elon Musk may be arrested and jailed in Brazil. Um, yes. <laughs> apparently there's a spat uh, between censorship and Brazil. Um, some people support censorship like they do here in America and they want Elon Musk to start blocking people. And this actually gets um, church leaders involved in the discussion, George. And they have to be careful. Very carefully involved. Carefully. Very carefully involved. Yeah. Uh, Alexander de Moraes uh, is a Supreme Court just, judge in Brazil 
who's going a bit crazy. And if you look at him, the fellow looks demonic. He's got a shaved head, dark eyes, dark eyebrows. He looks like he's some advertisement for uh, Satanism 101. Allegedly wow. looks demonic. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. He has uh, issued an order uh, charging Elon Musk, the uh, owner of X, or it used to be called Twitter, mm-hmm. of uh, disinformation, disregarding court orders and obstruction of justice. And he's seeking to shut down Twitter and demands that they block certain people and that they censor certain speech that he, the judge, doesn't like. So this is full-blown freedom of speech issue and censorship. And of course, where's the US government? Is they're going to protect a very major American corporation? No, of course not. They're on the side of the Brazilian government. Well, here's a funny little Anglican side of it. The uh, pro-Episcopal Church, uh, IEAB, Igreja Episcopal Anglicana do Brasil, they're all in favor of the Lula government and all this pro-censorship talk because they think that it needs to be stamped out, all these Christian nationalists and white nationalists and Klansmen and everything that they have running around Brazil. Uh, They think it should be stamped out by the Anglican Church, the one affiliated with the... uh, ACNA and the Global South is on the free speech side. Now, the problem is the Anglican Church has to keep their nose clean because they can wind up in jail. Yeah. Uh, as a number of the political opponents of this judge have been placed in jail. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a delicate situation, and you and I can be jokey about it, but it's really for the people in Brazil, this is life and death. Their, cover, their government is at the edge of falling into a left-wing authoritarian government. And one more, you know, it's a difficult time. It is. It's, yes, but we've watched this, you know, over and over again in South America where they elect somebody they hate and they basically have to depose him and get them out. And this isn't just Brazil. You, you name your country, Venezuela, Chile, all, you go through all these uh, um, countries by name. And then they'll elect another person that they learn to hate. They, they can't seem to find a good leader, left or right. I think Venezuela's finally got a, an okay one. Um, but it, it Oh, just, he's still a monster. Yes. He, he, Maduro he is. is a monster. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> you know, so we'll just have to see what happens. Um, yeah. It's crazy. But it's not crazy that... The Episcopal Church and the Anglicans got themselves in the news there. On to one more story down here. Mexico. Mexico. All right, so this is a complicated one in my mind. I'm going to have you describe it. But yeah, we know that the president of Mexico uh, was deposed. Primate of Mexico. Did I say president? Primate of Mexico was deposed. And uh, not if you ask the Episcopal Church. It's a, yeah. Well, back in September, the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Mexico, mm-hmm. uh, Trevino, uh, not Lee Trevino, he's a golfer, I think yeah. Enrique Trevino, was deposed as primate and bishop of, and, and was deposed as primate. Mm-hmm. And the reason was that it was discovered that uh, the election for the new bishop of northern Mexico and the, his election of primate was basically fraudulent. Mm-hmm. Uh, good old fashioned Mexican corruption taking place. Well, uh, some uh, three bishops in the House of Bishops of the Church of Mexico brought formal charges of misconduct. And in September, uh, Trevino was deposed from office by the Standing Committee of the Church of Mexico. And litigation ensued. And in March, a federal court affirmed uh, the deposition of Trevino. And on April 2nd, the Court of Appeals upheld that earlier decision. And Trevino is now under criminal investigation by the federales for, uh, in regards of breach of governments, breach of trust, procedural and notarial fraud. uh, For allegedly fixing synod and Episcopal elections and money changing hands and all this and that. Okay, corrupt bishop in Mexico. In some respects, this could be a Kevin and George story where he doesn't let me talk about India and corruption. (laughs) 
Well, here's the thing. If you go to the website of the Anglican Consultative Council, the guy who was deposed in September is still there, listed as the primate. That doesn't make any sense. Do they think we're you know, lying? Because, you know, within like 10 minutes of Jack Eicher and, and uh, yeah. uh, Bob Duncan and people like that, uh, Mark Lawrence being deposed yeah. by Love. the Episcopal Church, yeah. Bill Love, they were, whew, they disappeared into Never Never Land on the yeah. ACC's website. Well, Trevino's still there. Now, why is that? Well, I, I wrote to the ACC, Ellis, uh, Ellison Pogo, the new sec the current Secretary General, and I got a, well, he's in the Sudan visiting, and uh, we'll take your question under advisement and get back to you. Well, it's, I got a, for a Mex, maybe it's only fair for a Mexican issue, I got a Mexican answer. Manana. Manana. You know? Manana. 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 <laughs> Hasta mañana. Well, in yeah. talking to some of the Mexican bishops, mm -hmm. uh, some of whom are actually friends of this show, even though they're liberals, they find us entertaining for some reason. Happy fat gringos that yes. uh, we are. <laughs> Greg gringo. <laughs> uh, well, gordo gringo. Uh, but uh, <laughs> evidently, it's an old girls' network at play. What do you mean, George? An old that girls' network? Make sense. What? Well, Sally Sue Hernandez yeah. is the woman bishop of Mexico City. Mm -hmm. She uh, was, uh, we had a story about a month or so ago where Francis and uh, Welby invited uh, 50 bishops, 25 Catholic, 25 Anglican, from their countries uh, to Rome to be commissioned together to go out and do joint works together. And the Anglican bishop of Mexico City uh, was paired with a Mexican Roman Catholic bishop, Sally Sue Hernandez. And at the time, the uh, Catholic traditionalists were having heart failure because, oh my goodness, you're commissioning a Catholic uh, and an Anglican bishop to go do ministry. That means you're recognizing this woman's ministry. Well, well perhaps, perhaps not. Well, Sally Sue Hernandez is best buddies with Joe Bailey Wells. Well, who's Joe Bailey Wells? Well, I think Joe she's Bailey Wells. under the employment of Justin Welby, is she not? Yes, she used to be his assistant. She's yeah. now, uh, they're spreading the costs, and they've made her assistant secretary general, the Anglican Consultative Council. Mm -hmm. And she runs all these sort of uh, Potemkin shows on taking Lambeth forward and all this and that crap. And she's great friends. And Sally Sue Hernandez has been telling Joe Bailey Wells uh, no, 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 Trevino is still the man. So even though we've got a federal court in Mexico, and now the appeals court has come in saying this guy is a crook and he's out of there because friends of friends matter more than truth in the Anglican Consultative Council. And the ACC, a few, you know, we've been at loggerheads going back 15 years with the ACC. You know, when, when we reported, when the Archbishop of Kenya, Eliud, Eliud Wabakula, yep. uh, told us that uh, the uh, ACC was suborning fraud and forgery within his own church by getting the Bishop of Nairobi to forge a, a letter allowing him to go to the Zambia Lusaka ACC meeting. And at the time, uh, Josiah Dawu Faron, the ACC General Secretary, said, Kevin and George are liars, lying liars who lie. Just too bad we had the recording of Elio yes. Wabakula on the phone with us, telling yeah. us this. Yeah, and we've had a lot of stuff that the not a lot, but we've had occasional stories with the eight. last one was when we reported the Mozambique bishops were complaining that Ellison Pogo was an interfering in the election of a new primate, that the pro Welby guy uh, had only one supporter, and the anti Welby team who wanted to join the Global South and ditch the Welby Alliance. There were 10 of them versus two pro Welbyites. And how this guy, Pogo, went down to Mozambique, to Lorenzo Marquez, Maputo, it's now called, to try to lobby for the Welbyites. Oh, that's a lie. It's a terrible lie. Then, of course, we have the documents from the Welb, from the Mozambique bishops. So I'm sure something's going to come out. Oh, no, it's a lie. It's a terrible lie. We would not advocate for Bishop Trevino if he were not the true bishop of Archbishop of Mexico, instead of being somebody's friend's friend. Well, I think it's time for them to tell us why. Why is he still on the website? Why do they still recognize him as the primate of Mexico, even though he's been deposed, rightfully replaced, 
Um, and it's not just deposed by the church. It's been found uh, proper to depose them by the federal government. So, you know, let us know. If you want to put out a little statement, I, I will read that statement here on Anglican dot ink but we mentioned welby welby's in trouble again why well, not in trouble he's just he's having a bad it you you wrote here the, the title of the story bad week for justin welby george he's had a bad week a bad month a bad year this is just a bad decade for justin welby and it's not getting any better uh he put out uh, take away his phone he put out a tweet uh, issuing a congratulating the Muslims for uh, the latest holiday they're c celebrating. And I'm, I'm watching even liberals on Facebook responding to this Twitter saying, I don't get it. I, I, I don't. I don't understand where he's coming from. He is so overflowing with gracious words about celebrating Muslim holidays where a happy Easter gets a tweet like happy Easter. So we need to discuss this a little more. Bad week, you say, for Justin Welby. Yeah, Justin Welby put out a tweet congratulating Muslims on the Eid al-Fatir hospital with holiday, which is holiday. today. Yeah, I'm uh, not quite sure what it is. I think it's the end of Ramadan or something. Something to do with that. The week after the I'm yeah, the overly Ramadan. concerned. Yeah, and you know, oh, that's nice. You know, it's, you could say it's innocuous thing. Uh, I saw uh, uh, Munir Anis put out something congratulating his Muslim friends on the celebration of their holiday. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say that in and of itself being polite is a bad thing. For me, the story is this: that the comments over a thousand of them at the moment i looked at that tweet were uniformly negative and angry with justin welby i almost felt like uh i was watching scenes from the movie uh dr Zhivago, where the peasants are about to march down the street to the white winter palace and get rid of the czar mm -hmm. the degree of anger that people and it wasn't just all of a sudden every troll decided to pick on Justin Welby because there were people with normal names, normal handles, and their own pictures. You're not not fake handles, not you know robot uh, troll bots or whatever they're called. Just taking Welby to test, saying, "Why don't you stand up for your own faith? Yeah. Why don't you do something with the Church of England? Why don't you stand up for the English people?" The I'll call it hatred. There's a degree of hatred I've for Justin Welby that I have not seen for a religious figure. Nothing like this ever about Gene Robinson or Catherine Jefford Shorey or Bob Duncan or anybody on the other, you know. But Justin Welby has ins inspired a degree of animosity among rank and file English people that is just surprising me. I, I would be well, quite frightened if I were him. Well, I mean, the problem is not that he's tweeting at the end of the Ramadan fast uh, to mm -hmm. congratulate uh, the Muslims for that. The problem is he's not supporting in a balanced way or an overly balanced way his own faith on Twitter. And he, mm -hmm. he's more likely to side on this, uh, a topic of politics than he is on the side of Christ. He's more likely to side on the... the um, side of illegal immigration than he is on the, the the laws of his country and in in as such he's lost the benefit of the doubt people are more likely to doubt his sincerity than ever before and we're seeing this in you know in re response to his x tweets I, I keep saying twitter i mean to say x uh you know the, the formally named business of twitter is uh causing uh social media consumption of Justin Welby to go uh, berserk. You know, it's crazy. Welby, Welby has a problem of believing the news on the first few hours of the story and then looking like an absolute fool afterwards. Mm -hmm. We started, look at the Gaza. His tweets about Gaza have been asinine from the very beginning. From the attack on the hospital, which turned out to be not to an attack, uh, to this week, there's a you know, Welby had some tweets about the, uh, some aid workers killed when the Israelis uh, struck a uh, car belonging to the world kitchen table. And before there was any investigation, Welby put out a thing saying, this is unconscionable, this is illegal, this violates international law, 
basically the, the Jews are bad and evil people. Well, the investigation was done, and what they found was that Hamas had Hamas had been riding in that car. Hamas uh, operatives got out of the car. They were being tracked by the Israelis. The Israelis called the World Kitchen Table to say, you know, is this, uh, are you guys in bed with Hamas anymore, militants and whatnot? And they didn't get an answer to any of their calls. And so the man on the spot made the decision to strike. Hamas has used from the very beginning hospitals, schools, aid agencies to disguise the movement of their operatives, their terrorists. So the breach of international law here was not the Israelis striking this car. That was a terrible act. That was a terrible accident, but it was a consequence of the breach of international law by Hamas using aid agencies as a cover. Um, you know, all you had to do was wait a day or two or give some anodyne. Isn't it terrible that people are killed? I just hope things are better soon. Instead, we've got this foul outrage that betrays itself uh, each time as being ignorance and moral uh, moral cretinism. Sure. Well, here, I'm going to, uh, I pulled up a quote from Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton uh, was a president who worked as hard as he could to bring peace to the Middle East. He had the uh, uh, PLO. He had uh, the leader of Israel. He had them to... What's that country state they have here? Um, Camp David? Yeah, Camp David. Uh, yeah, where's my brain? He had him to Camp David uh, for two weeks. They, they had a tete-a-tete. -tete. And uh, here's what Bill Clinton says. Quote, I killed myself to give uh, Palest the Palestinians a state. I had a deal they turned down that would give them all of Gaza between 96 and 90 percent of the West Bank, compensation for land uh, in Israel, you name it. Hamas is really smart. When they decided to rocket Israel, they insulate themselves in the hospitals, in the schools, in the highly populous areas, and they are smart. They said they tried to put the Israelis in a position to either not defend themselves or to kill innocents. They're good at it. They're smart. And that's what they've been doing for a long time. Bill Clinton, Democratic oh, president. Kevin, Kevin, he's a, he's a right-wing stooge, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. You know, Democratic president of the United States for eight years. And, uh, you know, he, he told it like it is. He, he worked it out and tried to get it and, you know, offered 99% uh, of what uh, the PLO wanted. Didn't give it to him. They didn't want it. Crazy. And, you know, people say there has to be a solution in, in the Middle East. I don't know what it is. You know, if we can't come to some type of agreement, uh, death to Israel uh, is not an agreement. So. All right, George, do we have any other stories? I think we have one last oh, story. Oh, the Telegraph. Here. Yes. Um, I did not get any of this in my information feed. But you told me the Telegraph uh, wrote a story about a Welsh vicar who wants to pare down our liturgy to 15 easy to feed minutes hmm yeah it the, the telegraph had a sort of a complimentary story about a welsh uh, vicar who wants to create micro services no more than 15 minutes long to entice people to come to church the idea is that if the burden of being there for at least an hour hour and 15 minutes hour and 45 minutes if you come to my 10 30 service if that's lifted and all you have to do is come for 15 minutes, why did people just flock back in? Now, you can tell by my arch tone, I think this is one of the dumber ideas I've seen this week. I don't know. If all I had to spend in church was the time it took me to go through line at uh, uh, Chick-fil-A, you know, maybe. No, I, it is crazy. And what we're trying to do is make the, the gospel more palatable. That's not our job. That is not the job of Christians to make uh, the gospel more palatable and more uh, quick and fast and easy. Um, we're not the, the McDonald's of of, uh, of religions, you know. Now, it's one thing to acculturate people. In other words, to try to reach them where they are to mm -hmm. make them feel welcome and friendly. It's quite another thing to dumb it down to such an extent that... Uh, it's like just like punching a ticket. Yeah, I showed up. I got my ticket punched. And it's teaching a theology that you're not going to go to hell just by showing up for 15 minutes. You don't have to believe anything. You have to do
do anything. You just have to. I think you the have, mistake you ha is that have to love George. You have to love. Well, love. you know, it, in my mind, my way of thinking is, if I'm bothering to get in a car driving someplace, I want to spend at least more than fifteen minutes, or that's not even worth the drive. For us, the enjoyment of uh, going to church is fellowship, it's worship, and it's post-worship fellowship. You know, we're, we're there with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're there to encourage one another. Uh, I'm there to have sympathy with fathers of daughters and to encourage them along. I, you know, I mean, it, 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 is a, it is a blessing to me to spend my Sundays and other days of the week at church in fellowship with people who believe as I believe or, or want to strengthen their belief uh, as I have. So I don't know. That's crazy. No, That's our week of stories. Right, Kevin. Yeah, I absolutely mean, right. Yeah, uh, church is an event. Liturgy is an event. It's not just something you gotta uh, uh, do drive through. But we had drive through. You, what, the, this is just a uh, another formation of their drive through uh, ashes. You know, so. Crazy, George. It's been a fun week. Uh, please, if you want to help George, where you got a thousand, that's halfway there. We're going to send George to Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, what's the dates of that? June tenth to sixteenth. So we, we kind of want to buy plane tickets sooner than later. So if you, don't wait till June sixteenth to give us some money, please. We appreciate that. Go to Anglican Inc forward slash donate, and you will be. Greatly rewarded in news. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 850 of Anglican Unscripted.